Auto sequence start. Yeah, we have a go for auto sequence start. Discovery's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. Start, two, one, boost the ignition, and lift off of the space shuttle. Welcome to the Launchpad. I'm your host, Harry Washington. And those of you joining us for the first time, the Launchpad is sponsored by Persona Dream Corporation. Pursuing Dream Corporation is a nonprofit organization that encourages students in grades K through 12 to pursue degrees and careers in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and math. And today our focus is women in STEM. Our first guest is Dr. Laura Thomas. Dr. Thomas, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mr. Washington. Very glad to be here. Now, give our guests a, a brief history, a little background about yourself. Sure. Um, well, I, I grew up as a very curious kid. I was always mm -hmm. into trying to figure out why things were the way they were. And I had a toy microscope, and I would make slides, mm -hmm. you know, out of butterfly wings and okay. things that I would find and was just really fascinated by how the world is, is made up and what, okay. what, what, you know, what goes into that. Um, and, you know, luckily I was in an environment where that was, that was fostered. Um, okay. And my questions and my um, interest in science really grew in my teenage years in the mm -hmm. field of psychology and trying okay. to um, figure out, and I was really curious about what's going on mm -hmm. inside of us and what, okay. what's making us who we are and okay. our thoughts and our feelings, mm -hmm. our beliefs, mm -hmm. our relationships with other people. Um, and so I kind of started out thinking that I was going to become a clinical psychologist, oh, um, meaning that I would, you know, be doing therapy one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. or in groups trying to help people kind of improve their lives or get through really tough parts of their lives. Okay. Um, and in college, um, I was fortunate enough to um, take a biological psychology course, and mm -hmm. that really blew my mind. <laughs> um, finally, you know, not talk just talking about you know kind of theories about why we are the way we are but that okay. there's a biological basis okay. for this and um, and that that comes from the brain okay. and so that really piqued my fascination for the brain and how the brain and psychology um, go together which is okay. in the field of cognitive neuroscience which okay. is what I'm in so I look uh, and examine how brains are functioning in mm -hmm. people um, using you know, we're not we're not able to, you know, peer inside people's brains literally, but okay. we use a big machine called a functional MRI, and okay. we can take images and look at um, blood flow changes and what parts of the brain are active okay. when people are doing different things, and okay. be able to connect this biology of mm -hmm. the brain um, with some psychology and you know what people are feeling and their emotions, how they're making decisions, mm -hmm. and things like that. So yeah, it really, you know, my curiosity started in childhood and okay. um, in college, then I got really turned on to the brain. Okay. Now in terms of uh, growing up, wh wh where were you, did you grow up? Um, I grew up mainly um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan and outside Boston. Okay. So. And in terms of schooling, well, where did you go as it relates to school? Um, I went to undergraduate at Vassar College in um, the Hudson Valley and okay. then I for two years after school, I wanted to make sure that I was doing what I wanted to do. So right. I uh, was a research assistant at New York University okay. um, in a lab that studies emotion and the brain. Excellent. So I kind of just, you know, I knew that graduate school is a huge commitment. You don't want right. to just jump in without, exactly. without knowing that yet you're doing it for the right reasons. So um, I did that and then I moved to Duke University where okay. I got my PhD in psychology and mm -hmm. neuroscience. Excellent. Now, currently, you work at uh, the VA Medical Center here yeah. in Washington, D.C. Yes, I do. Now, what exactly does your job entail there as a neuroscientist? Yeah, well, um, um, as a neuroscientist at the D.C. VA Medical mm -hmm. Center, I am uh, really interested in veterans who have been through traumatic experiences okay. in war. And we have a lot of veterans coming, coming home from conflicts okay. and um, 
I'm really interested in looking at some of the differences and how some people will come home and seem to function okay. They can okay. get jobs, they have pretty good relationships, okay. um, and some people have a really hard time. They have right. chronic nightmares, they're just plagued with anxiety, right. they're not able to really hold a job, mm -hmm. um, their whole lives suffer. And, and okay. so that, that, what I'm really looking at is called post-traumatic stress disorder right. or PTSD. Right. Um, so I'm interested in looking at how veterans who seem to be doing okay, okay versus these veterans who are having a really hard time and suffering from PTSD what's different in their brains and what can what how have their experiences uh, their wartime experiences affected um, their neurological functioning and then how that how that influences influences their lives okay. now you've also uh, been very active in terms of uh, outside of your field in uh, with organizations such as the Association of women in science. Mm -hmm. Now, how long have you been a member with them, and what sparked this interest in, in um, encouraging girls to pursue uh, careers in STEM? Yeah, well, I've been um, a member with AWIS for about two years, okay. um, and in graduate school, I participated. I was awarded a fellowship through the Society for Neuroscience, um, okay. uh, specific for women in neuroscience okay. to get you know to foster uh, young female okay. neuroscientists, um, mm -hmm. and I found that. Um, a very rewarding experience. I'm um, right. getting to network, you know, and right. see these role models of other mm -hmm. female scientists. I think a lot of what, um, a lot of the dis disparity we see in these fields comes from a lack of role models, and it's kind of a, you know, self-perpetuating cycle in that, um, you know, young girls, teenagers, and even, you know, as, as a young adult, I, I didn't have um, scientific role models, female okay. scientists that that I could look up to right. or right. Um, model my career after. And right. so, um, you know, having exposure to this women in neuroscience mm -hmm. through the Society for Neuroscience really opened my eyes to how how mentorship can have a big impact on on you know, females um, pursuing careers in, in STEM. And AWIS is very active, uh, you know, in doing outreach to, um, to schools and, and especially to girls to reach, to reach them, to show them that females can be scientists and we're not, um, you know, we're not scary and we're right. not, <laughs> we're just like everybody else. Um, but but in, in your opinion, why is it, uh, in terms of different question, why is it that girls, and we asked this question before of other guests, why is it that girls have a lack of interest in science? Well, some girls, not all girls. Right. Why? So I think, you know, having, um, I think it's a larger issue than just science. I think it okay. has to do with the way gender roles are in right. general in okay. society, where okay. we, um, you know, we really promote boys' curiosity and right. building things right. and constructing things and, yeah. um, and, you know, females are more rewarded for group cooperation right. and, exactly. you know, talking and, right. and relationships. And um, I feel like these stereotypes start yeah. very early. Right. And um, even, you know, parents and preschool teachers and right. elementary school teachers can have a big impact by, you know, fostering their, their children's curiosity and even mm -hmm. just asking, you know, going, kids go through that why stage, why right. is everything happening? Right. Um, and don't let that stage stop, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and foster, foster that sense of curiosity and, um, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, how do you feel that your, your, the skills that you obtain have been vital in your, in your success? Um, yeah, well, I couldn't be where I am without my education. Right. Um, and I feel like I actually came to science kind of late because okay. I was, you know, later on in college. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really matter when True. you become excited about science. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, without going to college, without have, ha getting a graduate degree, um, I wouldn't be able to you know, do what I do now, which is, which is uh, hopefully going to be able to help okay. veterans who have suffered. Um, so, yeah. But in terms of going back to the, the, the statements you made about girls being conditioned differently than boys, uh, why is that? Why, why do you think that exists? And just, I mean, why are girls being taught, well, in, in some instances that maybe you can't be a scientist like Dr. Thomas. Maybe mm -hmm. you could be something else. Why, why do you think it's that condition? Um, is it more is it more the parent or is it more just environmental other environmental? I think it's it's 
I don't think you can isolate out one thing. Okay. I think it's just pervasive in our okay. culture, and it's going to take, and it's going to take changes along every step of the way. So starting with parents and, okay. you know, getting girls interested in science with science kits or, right. you know, I mean, I think now in schools they're trying to make science more applicable to the real world, which is really right. important because when it remains something that just seems very esoteric and, right. you know, kids don't really see how it applies to their life, mm -hmm. then they're not going to be interested in pursuing that. Right. Um, and, you know, more schools are having after school programs, yes. and yeah. I was just reading the Washington Post this morning, there was an article about a, a program in Reston uh, okay. for middle school girls on okay. uh, coding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, computer science and coding and, um, you know, having, f you know, girls only mm -hmm. types of types of um, programs where girls can really get that confidence mm -hmm. up, because I think that that it, confidence and self-esteem has okay. a big part to do with why girls are not pursuing STEM right, so. careers. Um, so fostering that confidence mm -hmm. and um, and you know curiosity in these girls mm -hmm. that it's okay to ask questions exactly. and it's okay to um, make mistakes. And a lot of science is failure. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And, Very true. And um, but you know, you, with a thousand times you fail, you get one success, right. and that can help move science forward. So I think it's really important mm -hmm. that we get and continue to, you know, push and have programs like this one right. um, and, you know, other programs like the one I mentioned at the middle school in Reston that mm -hmm. promote girls um, specifically in STEM careers. Yeah. So, so what are steps you think can be taken to, for, for parents as well as educators to kind of get students, well, girls in particular, mm -hmm. more interested in STEM, other than the after-school programs, other than, like, parents getting more involved? What other things you think can be done? Um, well, I think at a larger societal level, we need to kind of change how scientists are viewed. Um, it could be intimidating. Sure, in and, and just kind of what we think of our stereotypical scientists right. in our head. Um, one great thing that happened just recently was that Obama teamed with Google okay. and had girls code the lights for the the National Christmas tree. Okay. He they he had girls from all over the country wow. code the designs wow. that were on those trees, okay. um, and something like that. That's you know really makes something like you know, coding that seems right. like it would be just kind of like a dorky person and like hiding in right. their room, mm -hmm. uh, very antisocial, but looking mm -hmm. at how, you know, you can be very creative, okay. um, a very, you know, it's a lot of teamwork involved okay. and things like that. Um, right. And Mindy Kaling, who is a, you know, TV okay. personality mm -hmm. and Chelsea Clinton um, were also heavily involved in this Excellent. girls and coding. So mm -hmm. getting more spokespeople out mm -hmm. there, um, at the you know at the larger level that right. girls look up to these people right. um, is is really important. There are also some books uh, about math for girls by okay. um, the woman who played Winnie Cooper on The Wonder Years. Uh, excellent. Um, excellent. Yeah, and she actually has written a number of, of books that have had a huge impact. She re because it makes she makes science relatable to girls, and right. so kind of what I was saying before, having real world, making right. it making it accessible um, to all kids, but especially right. you know I think girls need that special mm -hmm. um, they need special fostering just because of the environment that we still have that right. that promotes um, boys and that boys are thought of as has av as having more mm -hmm. you know innate abilities in this okay. field, which is just not not the case. Very true. Uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Thomas for her time. We'll be back. Welcome back to Launch Back. I'm your host, Harry Washington. And again, we're focusing on women in STEM. Today, our guest today, well, our second guest for today, rather, is Dr. Catherine Vole. Uh, welcome to the show, Catherine. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Now, give our guests a little bit, bit of background on you. So I have my PhD in molecular and cellular biology and biochemistry from Brown University. Okay. And I have been, I'm what's called a basic scientist. Okay. So I study how things work in general within the body, how molecules interact, all sorts of things like that. Um, I started my career in science mm -hmm. actually at an all women's college at Mount Holyoke College, okay. which was where I entered thinking I wanted to be a veterinarian. Okay. And one of the things about sort of 
starting a program in veterinary medicine is that you have to take a lot of a lot of different science courses. Okay. So I had experience with lots of different kinds of sciences. Okay. And towards the about my junior year in college, I decided to start doing some independent research. Okay. And I found a wonderful mentor who is still still a mentor, still a very good friend, and joined her lab. Realized I really liked doing science. I really liked being at the bench. Okay. And I ended up staying after I graduated an extra two years in her lab okay. and decided I didn't want to go to vet school anymore. I wanted to go get my PhD okay. and spent five years at Brown University okay. and now I'm a professor at Trinity Washington University, another all women's college. Right. Now, what, I mean, because I, uh, I think all, most our guests can see the excitement on, in, your, in your expressions, but what fascinates you the most about science? I love the discovery. Okay. I love, and, and that's sort of twofold for me. Mm -hmm. I love being at the bench, knowing that at any time I could discover something completely new that nobody's ever thought of or, or investigated before. Okay. Um, the other half of that, though, now that I'm moving more into teaching, mm -hmm. is I get to see that on my students' faces all the time. Okay. And that's really rewarding. It's okay. it's wonderful to take, I work mostly with first year students. Okay. And it's wonderful to take these students who may have some, some negative connotations, especially right. with chemistry, okay. and to take them through this, this semester and see the pieces sort of fall in together where they start to realize how mm. what we're learning in class is actually affecting what they're what they're doing in their lives, how Excellent. this basic science really relates directly to how they live every day. Now, how long have you been a professor? <laughs> I have only been I have only been an official professor for one semester, but I've been teaching and mentoring for a lot longer than that. So, what inspired you to become a teacher? I I think it it really goes back to that discovery. Okay. I really like the interactions that I have okay. with my students. I really like the idea of shaping them the way okay. that my professors shaped me. Okay. And I feel like I can have a really big impact on mm -hmm. the future of you know, local, global, okay. sort of everything by sharing my love of science okay. with these students. So that based on your experience, I mean, like I said, you know, your undergrad experience, well, your graduate, um, and your doctoral experience, even, even your teaching experience, what are some of the barriers that women face versus, well, girls face versus boys? There are several barriers, okay. and they happen sort of at all different levels. One of the first barriers is that girls get this message, generally between 8 and 12, okay. that it's not cool to do science. Okay that science is a boy thing and girls don't do science. Okay. It's a very pervasive message and unfortunately it's not, it's pervasive but it's not blatant. Okay. If you start to look for it, you'll see it all over the place. So one of the best things that we can do for girls in science mm -hmm. is to encourage them. If girls mm -hmm. are interested in science at, at six, at seven, at eight, to make sure that you encourage that interest and, okay. and keep them going through that difficult transition. Okay. Now I'm going to throw you a curveball. How does social media kind of reinforce that message that science may be not cool for girls? I think that the media plays a huge role, and social media in particular. Mm -hmm. Kids are consuming so much social media. I, right. I didn't have to deal with any of this when I was coming up as, as a child in high school, even in right. college. Okay. Um, and it again, it's sort of that underlying issue with when mm -hmm. you see things about science, it's always boys. Right. When you hear about people doing well in the sciences, mm -hmm. it's almost always boys or men. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. I think that children today are really bombarded with images of men doing science, but there are very few mm -hmm. of women. And okay. I think one of the best examples recently was mm -hmm. there's been a big debate over the Barbie book. Uh, <laughs> Barbie, Barbie was going to be a, she was working with computers. Okay. And rather than having Barbie actually do some programming and design okay. her game, okay. Barbie was only the graphic designer. Okay. I think that's a really 
key example okay. of what young girls especially okay. are being exposed to on a daily basis. Right. Oh, so but how do you um, explain the other aspect of the glamorous aspect about Facebook, uh, Facebook, I'm sorry, or other social media sites, and that pinpoint uh, Facebook, but where they get to see just that these women looking glamorous and beautiful, and they don't necessarily have to be as intelligent or you know aspire to be a doctor or an engineer or anything else. What do you think about that? I think that's that's really another. It, it's sort of the same. It's a different side of the same coin. Okay. Really. Our girls are getting bombarded with this image that, you know, you you it's first for a girl. It's important that you're pretty. Right. It's okay if you're smart, but really, it's more important that you're pretty. Right. And I think part of that really ties into, especially at this really vulner vulnerable age from right. eight to twelve, right. that you know you you want to you want to keep your smarts under wraps. You okay. don't necessarily right. want to show that you're too smart. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of, now again, you have to find it, but there mm -hmm. is some social media pushback to say, hey, there are lots of girls out there who are really smart and doing amazing things. True. And if you can find them, if you can encourage girls to go find those sites, to mm -hmm. follow those groups on Facebook, okay. I think that's gonna have a huge effect on how girls perceive themselves and perceive themselves as potential scientists. Now, because we, we talked about, we're back to the, the point that we started with, what are the, some of the advantages of, of pursuing for girls, pursuing an advanced degree in STEM? It's a really rewarding field. There's okay. so much that you can do with a STEM degree. Okay. It's not just about you know, learning the different organs in the body or right. learning the different molecules. STEM fields really teach you a way of thinking. Okay. And you can take that way of thinking and apply it through so many different fields. Okay. It's really a wonderful skill set to, mm -hmm. skill set to have. <laughs> and it's something that I think a lot of people underestimate. True. And so even if you're not, you know, maybe you don't want to be a research scientist, mm -hmm. but a grounding in STEM is mm -hmm. going to set you up for really whatever career you might want to pursue. True. How can parents and educators start preparing young girls for college? I think that there's two, there's so many things that you can do, but I think okay. the two most important ones are first encouraging your girls in science. Excellent. If they show interest, nurture that by taking them to museums, mm -hmm. buying them science books, you know, knowing that, that a lot of the times those science books are going to show boys on the cover okay. and be prepared to, to talk about that with Good them. Point. The other thing that we need to do as a society is mm -hmm. we need to address our unconscious bias against women in science. Sure. There was a really nice research study that came out a few years ago mm -hmm. in which they gave professors, science professors, mm -hmm. identical resumes, okay. except that one had a boy's name on it and one had a girl's name on it. Okay. The results showed that professors were far more likely not only to hire the person the, mm -hmm. from the resume with the boy's name, mm -hmm. they were also likely to pay them more and invest more time in mentoring them. Wow. This held true regardless of whether that scientist was a man or a woman. Okay. So we really do have this pervasive idea mm -hmm. in our society that women aren't as good as science no. as men are. And that's something that we all need to address, mm -hmm. whether we're scientists or not. Right. So, like I said, when you start looking at the media that's out mm -hmm. there, start questioning, why is this toy marketed exclusively to boys? Or right. why is this toy marketed exclusively to girls? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at you, Lego. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Directly at Lego. <Yeah. laughs> um, I, I think that the more we can address issues like right. that, Okay. the better it's going to be for not just our girls in science, but our right. boys in science, too. Right. Good points. Excellent points. We'd like to thank both our guests uh, that appeared on the show today. Remember, um, girls, science is cool. Harry mentioned about business planning.
business plans. So I review a lot of business plans. Uh, so that's what I do. Some companies that are uh, much more advanced versus that are just starting out. So uh, we offer workshops, we offer uh, guidance, we offer uh, expo or events. Uh, so those are all on our website. It would follow. I'd like to tell you, I'm excited to have the honor to come before you. I have such respect for young entrepreneurs. Um, being one myself years ago, uh, when I was 11, it was exciting, but uh, the difference was we didn't have a lot of resources. I get excited when I speak to you because you're our future. Does anyone know what a patent is? This is a paper airplane. Does anybody think this can be patented? Yes. Very good. And I have the patent for it right here. It was patented in 1983. So it doesn't have to be something complicated like a microphone. It could be something as simple as a paper airplane. So always make sure that you don't underestimate your ideas. I'm 15 years old and I'm the CEO and owner of Kennedy's Packages. I first got credit. My mom showed me how to make my first pair of pants. And then I got credit. And my mom started making, managing me to start doing vending shows. My name is Amaya. I'm 13 years old and I'm a grade writer at Old Rhyme School. I'm the president and CEO of Kitchen LLC. And it's a local company that makes Kitchen soap. Primarily, what we talk about is more how you prepare yourself than how you prepare the outer shell. Because if you blow it with the outer shell, I mean, if you really hit it on target and you have on a real nice suit, your suit is $600 and, and you feel real good about it, then you can blow it with the way you present yourself. Yeah. See, some folks don't think about it, but you need another stream of income. 